1, we'll find our way back into Mark chapter 1, and we will uh, go ahead and read Mark 1, 1 on down, and kind of, this is what we looked at last week, but we'll go ahead and just read through it, kind of get the get our feet back under us. All right, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now remember, we talked about last week, Mark just kind of comes out, doesn't he? He just kind of, he's, he's like shot out of a barrel on this deal, okay? As it is written with the prophets, Behold, I send my messengers before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Remember, Mark immediately gets into the ministry of John the Baptist. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea. And they of Jerusalem were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. John, he was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey. He preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latches of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan. Straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Reiterating verse 11, there came a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son. Right? That art my beloved son, this is him, in whom I am what? Well pleased. I am pleased with, with him for who he is, for he is my son. This is the one that John the Baptist just got done mentioning. There comes one after me, right? There's going to come at one after me who's mightier than I, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. John the Baptist is talking about the Son of God, right? So there's one coming after me. I am not even worthy to stand in His presence. I'm not. Who am I to stand in the, in the presence of this one? Who am I to stand in the presence of, of who he is? John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy to even be around him. I am so sinful. Right? The voice we know from heaven was who? It was the Father, wasn't it? Well pleased with His Son. Well pleased with who His Son was. Well pleased with what His Son would do. His Son would redeem a mankind. And the Father announces, He says, Thou art my beloved Son. In other words, look at Him. I am well pleased with Him. Sort of a divine witness. Right? Sort of a divine witness as to who He is. And the question for us this evening, as it always is, is how pleasing are we to Christ? Right? 
how pleasing are we to him. You know, that's the great thing about substitutionary time. Yeah. Is when he says, this is my son and whom I am well pleased, he can look at me, yeah. wretched sinner, and he sees Christ. And he, even though I failed him nonstop, It's all of Christ, isn't it? As Justin said, substitutionary atonement. It atones for us. It atones for us. When the Father looks at us, He sees His Son. He sees His Son and He's pleased, isn't He? He's pleased. In Luke chapter 9, verse 28, if you remember in Luke 9, 28, And it came to pass after eight days after these sayings, He took Peter and James and John and went up into a mountain to pray. As He prayed, the fashion of His countenance was altered and His, his raiment was white and glistering. The transfiguration, Right? And behold, there would talk with him two men, Moses and Elijah. Can you imagine the scene? Could we even look upon the scene, right? Who appeared in glory. And spake of his decease or his death, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. They spoke of the death of Christ. The way that's phrased there, his death he was about to accomplish. Yeah. Who of us has ever said, man, I'm ready to get ready to accomplish death? That's the only way Christ could have died, was to accomplish it. To, to accomplish. have it be. His goal, His purpose from the get-go to have that yeah. be His task. Because yeah. that's the only way He could die. Because He was sent. Yeah. To accomplish the task at where? Jerusalem. They were speaking about His death from from the world, his, his exodus from the world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. But Peter still doesn't get it. Peter, when they were with him, and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were awake, they saw His glory and the two men that stood with Him. They witnessed the glory, didn't they? When they woke up, they seen the glory of Christ. Now what was that like? Huh? I don't know. Did you ever think about that? Like Moses' Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Very interesting, isn't it? You talk about being woke up out of sleep. They saw his glory immediately upon waking up. 
I mean, how do you even look at that, right? Not just his glory, the two men that stood with him. Moses and Elijah. Two men. And it came to pass as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, is it good for us to be here? Let us make three tabernacles. See, stop right. Peter doesn't see clearly, does he? He don't. Yeah. Yeah. Probably running around like a little nut. Can't control himself. He don't know what to do. Yes. That's Peter, right? Yeah. One other time. I gotta be doing something. Mm-hmm. I can't just sit here and worship. I can't just sit yeah. here and learn. Yeah. I gotta be doing something. Yeah. I gotta be doing yeah. something. You're exactly right. It's a very interesting point. You ever hear people tell somebody else to take the rollerblades off at church or you know, there's always always doing something. They're always just and you got Peter here, and he wakes up, and he says, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles. Is it okay for us to be here? Let us, let us make three. Let's make three. But who took them there? The world don't see that yeah. Christ takes you everywhere. Yeah. Christ chose Peter for yeah. a reason. Peter had a very difficult time getting rid of the world. Can we all identify to that? When we do something stupid, don't we want to go to the world first to get straightened out? This is, and, and Peter had such a heart. Christ was such a master teacher. He let him experience. Now this, how would you explain it? How, I mean, if, no. if you were just taken up on this little old hill here, why me? Because Christ chose you yeah. for a particular reason. Yeah. Man, think of that. Yeah. And in, in this, I don't know what I am. I'm, I'm going to probably start slamming a bunch of rocks together yeah. thinking that was appropriate at the yeah. time. Yeah, and he was doing it. I mean, you got to wonder if he, would, if he was doing it in such a hurry because Moses and Elijah were walking off. It says what in verse 33, and it came to pass as they departed from, as, or as they were leaving, right? As, as Moses and Elijah were talking about, if I'm understanding correctly. Yeah, as Moses and Elijah were probably starting to leave. Peter says unto Jesus, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three, right? Don't go nowhere, guys. Stay right here. Don't run off. But we see very shortly, Father comes involved again. And once again, he addresses this in my beloved. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Whatever you just witnessed, I, Father, have just said this once again, my beloved. Yeah. One and only. Can't, no others. There's no ten. One and only is the one that can do the mission. Exactly. The mission. Yeah. This is him. Yeah. This is him. And that follows Old Testament law. What? On the basis of two or three witnesses. Jesus was testified of himself. The Spirit was testified of Christ when he came down Two witnesses 
and then who's coming out and putting it into the world it, this book never never shifts from its principles no. of Jesus Christ one and only yeah. with the triune triune yeah. and Moses and Elias was the prophet and the law the old right there and confirming his Peter knew enough that he knew of the old, the Torah. It, he knew that well. But he's just been witness to something. So uh, Yeah, this is way this is way beyond him. His pay grade has yeah. never yeah. hit there. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. He says unto Jesus, Master, is it good for us to be here? It's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for them, or one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias or Elijah, not knowing what he said. I mean, he, he was just rambling on, wasn't he? Just rambling on. But while he thus spoke, there came a cloud and over overshadowed them and they feared as they entered into the cloud. Terror grips them, doesn't it? Amen. Terror. There came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my what? Beloved Son, hear Him. Hear Him. It is He. This is my Son. This is my chosen one. In other words, hear Him. Listen to Him. Right? Listen to Him. There's no one else to listen to but Him, the Father says. Listen to him. And the author of this book is the one and only, as Bob says, the master teacher, the master author. Listen to what it has to say. You know, Peter, James, and John, as long as they listened to what Christ had to say, was saying, was going to say, everything was going to be okay. But the minute they start listening to the world, those around them, or however you want to look, anything else but Christ, the minute they start listening to anything else but Christ, now the problem set in. Sound familiar? All right, they do. We all can relate to that, can't we? Came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus only. You listen to what he has to say. As somebody just said a second ago, the Father's testimony to the Son. And in verse 36, and when the voice was passed, or when the voice finished, Jesus was found alone. And they kept it close and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. Jesus is found alone, it says. They didn't tell anyone at the time of what they had seen. The glory of Christ would be shared with no one. As spectacular as what they seen, the glory of Christ was not going to be shared. Right? 
be shared with no one. The glory of the Lord God shall never be shared with no one. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. Let me see here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4 through 6, As concerning therefore the eating of these things that are offered in sacrifice to the idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other than God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, there shall be gods many and lords many. But to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things, and we by Him. The glory of the Most High will be shared with no one. Peter, James, and John just got a little glimpse of it. And it shocked them. It shocked them. But how would the world even begin to understand if they were to try to explain what they had witnessed? The world can. Yeah, yeah you've been out for again, yeah. or whatever the, the verbiage would be. This was such a privilege. Privilege. Yeah, I mean, how do you... Yeah, They're not going to listen to anything they have to say. I mean, I wouldn't think. These three were with Jesus on very special events several times. Uh, why Christ chose them? That's between them and Christ. But he had these three on four And you can and you can turn it back to ourselves. That, that, that's a real good point. The, the Lord, I mean, he he trained them up for whatever task it was, and it's no secret they were put in very high positions. And it's the same thing for us today. He trains us up for whatever task he has planned for us, whatever task he has willed for us. He places us there for his glory, for his honor. For nothing else. In Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8 it says this, I'm the Lord, this, this is my name. My glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Now remember, just a second ago, Peter wakes up and says what? Let's build three tabernacles, right? Let's build one to Moses, Elias or Elijah. Let's build one to Jesus. But here we see Isaiah 42, 8. I will give my praise, my glory, never to another. Never. That's why, you know, so many people that cherry pick verses to create their theology mm -hmm. around it. You know, just like he was talking earlier about this, this Jesus humble. You know, they'll pull that verse out and say, oh, it says, one God, the Father. Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, it says one God the Father. You know, the Shema from Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Muslims, man, it's blasphemy to say three. Yeah. In their holy book, it's blasphemy to say three. Three. But we know from Scripture, the totality of Scripture, yeah, God is one. So God is trying you. Mm -hmm. He doesn't share his glory with another like you well, we've got to figure those things out in our mind. He doesn't share his glory, but he gives glory to the Son. So either the Son is God, or God is wrong. Mm -hmm. we got to figure out, where is the consistency in Scripture? Yeah. The only consistency is, God is one, God is triune. The Son is God, because that's the clear teaching of Scripture. We yeah. talked about Athanasius. Athanasius stood alone on the doctrine of the Trinity in the fourth century. 
Arius had all these songs, these clever songs devised to, to win people to Arianism. But no, the truth stood alone with that the nations. Yeah. History and scripture have been witnesses that the nations were right, even though he stood alone. Yeah. See, and that and that's the important thing of just as exactly right of studying scripture in its totality and it's from 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 the front to the back Boz may mention in the past it's a tapestry it weaves itself together it, it ties itself so so nicely together doesn't it but if you're not careful and it's very easy to do this again you start to cherry pick Preachers have a horrible habit of doing this. A horrible habit. They just cherry pick through Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, whatever's going on the time of the day, or the, the, the news, or whatever they're studying, or whatever they're just kind of interested in of that week or month or whatever it is, and just kind of flop around. Well, there, was a, there was a whole generation where topical sermons yes. were the main yes. meaning. Yeah. And it's a lot easier verses to support the topic as opposed to having a scripture and figuring out what that scripture means. Yeah. And I'm not saying there's not a place for no. topical sermons, but it's easier to get off track yeah. when we're finding scripture to meet a topic yeah. rather than figuring out what the topic of the scripture is. Yeah, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. He says, I'm not going to give my glory to another. Peter would learn this. James would learn this. John would learn this. His glory was not going to go to another. And as Justin just said, him and the Father. Bob said, I want. Or one. John the Baptist preached the coming of the Redeemer, the glory of Christ, whose sandals I am not even worthy to even bend down to. And untie. He knew that he was standing before the same one when Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. Yeah. Of people of unclean lips. John the Baptist knew that was the same Yahweh standing in front of him that Isaiah wrote. Yeah. Yeah. You're exactly right. The very one that stood over Saul. As Saul laid in a fetal position, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to do? And it says in verse 12 of Mark chapter 1, And immediately the Spirit driveth him, or drove him, or took him into what? The wilderness, right? Immediately took him into the wilderness. Immediately, yeah. That's Mark. Yeah. Yeah. And that was Mark's personality, wasn't it?
immediately the Spirit drives him into the wilderness. The Spirit guides him, if you will. And there in the wilderness, 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. The temptation, the temptations of the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan unleashed an arsenal, didn't he? Everything he had. Everything he had. He unleashed it. He unleashed an arsenal. If you remember back in Genesis chapter 3, Real quick. It says verse twelve, and immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Compelled? Yeah, Compelled would have been the NLT. Is that the yeah. NLT says? Okay. Yeah. I, I knew there was another version that said something. Yeah. Matthew said let him. Let him. Matthew said let him. I mean, yeah, where, where did he say, he said, I've come to do the will of my Father. Amen. Nothing else. Perfect. Perfectly. I've come to do his will. I have nothing else to do. But the will of my Father. Genesis 3.15, I'll cause enmity or hostility between you and a woman, between your offspring and her offspring. I'll strike your head, or he'll strike your head, and you will strike his heel, or whatever, you're, whatever version you're looking at. I mean, a reference to what? Christ. You will strike his heel. But the blow he gives you will be a death blow. He finds his way into the wilderness. He's compelled to go into the wilderness. He's led into the wilderness for 40 days. Tempted of Satan. No mere man would last five minutes. The first Adam did. The second Adam succeeded with this first Adam faith. Yep. Yep. Forty days. Tempted of Satan. It was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered unto him. There's a reference of a Speaking of ministering angels, it's a very, it's a very uh, encouraging reference about ministering angels in Hebrews chapter one, verse verse fourteen. I mean, take heart in this verse here. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be an heir of salvation?
the angels that minister to Christ are sent to you who will be an heir of salvation. Think about that for a second. Read it again. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who will inherit the kingdom? Is what he's saying. The ministering angels. To God's children. The writer of Hebrews is saying it. Even before you come to faith, you have been set apart and they are ministering to you for the appropriate time. It's hard for us to get our mind around that, isn't it? It's difficult. And the angels minister unto him in Mark chapter 1 verse 13. Mark chapter 1 verse 13. The ministering angels to the Son. And the angels sought to take care of his needs. They are to serve with the Son as the privilege of sitting at the right hand of the Father. And the angels serve us also. Yeah. Be over. I mean, that, that whole first chapter of Hebrews that you just spoke from, it's all about Christ is better than angels. Amen. As great as angels are, mm -hmm. Christ is better than angels. Mm -hmm. And that kind of shoots the, the Seventh day Adventist theology in the book because they believe Christ is like them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's always, again, it's always about, as John the Baptist said, lifting Christ up. Lifting Jesus up. Remember where he said, was it in John 3.30 or somewhere around there? I don't know. Something 3.30. I must decrease, he must what? Increase. Amen. Always that. I must decrease, he must increase. I forget where it is, I'm trying to... It is, is it 330? I must decrease, he must increase. It's always about lifting the Lord Jesus up. To his rightful place. Never did the father say. This is Moses in whom I'm well pleased. This is Elijah in whom I'm well pleased. No. This is my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased. And everything he done. As somebody said before, he did it. Bob said, he did it perfectly. Amen. Without error. Even in the wilderness for 40 days, he did it perfectly. He did it perfectly. That's why every challenge that was presented to Christ, he spoke his father's word. And Satan knew the book so yeah. well. He said, man, I, yeah. this is God that's before me. Everything I throw at him, he is throwing it right back mm -hmm. perfectly from his father. I can't find the niche to work on. He just perfectly 
face this father back to me. Just pound me. And 40 days, he, he thought he would get just a little nick where he could get him to look at him and, and give him a little praise. But he got no praise. Period. Mm -hmm. Nothing out of Christ. Yeah. Didn't draw the first yeah. out of boy. No. No. Nothing. That's why it's been said many times. The devil was powerful. The devil was God's devil. The devil can do no more than God allows him to do. He can't go God into a battle royale. Yeah. He is serving God's purpose. Yeah. According to God's purpose. Exactly. Exactly. Though this world with devils filled is a mighty fortress. Trying to find the lion. Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath will his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. Yeah. Yeah. One little word. I mean, you can, you look in Scripture, you can see when the demon-possessed people would come into the presence of Christ. The different reactions. All basically found the same road in their reaction. This is the Son of God. There's nothing I can do. Their different reactions would be, you know, they 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 ask him questions. One even said, "Have you come before our time? You know, are you here to judge us before our time?" You, the others fell before him. They understood, didn't they? Who he was and who they. True. It's true. It's true. They don't have no problem recognizing Christ. No. That's all. Right, you know, they always recognize. They won't have the. Yeah. Like yeah. They recognize him for who he is. The Redeemer of the world, the Son of God. They always honor him. You know what I said? Oh, yeah. You're the Holy One. You're the Holy One. Yeah. They honor him by talking about who he is. The demons believe and trust the demons believe and trust because they know who he is. And we've talked about before, isn't that a shocking passage of Scripture? The demons believe and tremble, but we live in a day and time where people don't even tremble at the thought. I mean, when the demons think of him, they tremble at the thought. Trembled with fear. Fear. You know, when you tremble, I mean, that's a pretty powerful word, isn't it? An uncontrollable fear. That should make us cling to Him even tighter for what He's done for us. As Justin said at the beginning, because when the Father looks at us, we have nothing to fear because we are clothed with His Son. But that should make us tremble for those who are not clothed 
with the Son. Who have not that protection. That should make us tremble for them and fear for them. The lack of fear of who he is and who we are. The lack of fear of who he is. That takes us to, I think John, yes, John's uh, imprisonment. Pick up in verse in verse fourteen. Uh, we'll see if that's where we'll go from in the next time. Does anybody else have anything this evening? Peter was a big influence in his life. He's a, he's a big influence. And you could see, like you said, some of Peter in the Gospel of Mark. You could see some of Peter in it, you know. Some of it kind of tied together. Yeah, absolutely. So, but, yeah. And uh, Peter's house was a, was, a very, uh, was a very respected place. It was a place of a lot of, you know, a lot of meetings went on. So, uh, where Mark found himself there on a number of occasions. So, anybody else have anything? Amen. 
Justin, you want to close us this evening, brother? Amen.